end the week at West River United Methodist Camp. Now, some of you may have been there for a retreat, because I know that it is a lovely place to retreat with other women or youth or men. And I know that some of you have gone there on mission to make improvements to the cabin and improve the plumbing. And when I first wrote this sermon, I said some of the youth had been there as campers and counselors, but when I was here this morning for the first service, story after story, I heard about the senior adults who had been there as youth and children and counselors. Less than just 20 minutes from here, the camp encompasses 45 acres of God's creation. And you can enjoy Sabbath time with God as you walk along the picturesque lakeshore, or hike the forest trails, or scout out the creatures in the marsh. I went there with two of my grandchildren, Megan, who's 11, and Molly, who's only six. The camp offers two sessions each summer for intergenerational camping. The goal is for children to learn something about themselves and feel the love and support of the community around them and be inspired to live an authentic Christian life. But I love the feeling of being close to my grandkids in a place where I feel close to God. It's a beautiful camp and quite luxurious. We stayed in the air-conditioned retreat center. There were plenty of couches in the room where we gathered for Bible study, and our other common room provided a big, clean, open space for playing games on rainy days. Oh, the food was delicious and so plentiful, thank, thanks to the great kitchen staff, like one of our own members, Dolores Bowling. Dolores and I delightfully waved to each other across the counter at supper each night. My grandchildren take camp comforts, like air conditioning and flush toilets for granted. Their eyes pop and their mouths drop when we tell them what camp was like when we were kids. West River didn't have air conditioning then. In fact, in the 50s, you were lucky if you had screened windows on your cabin. When I was a youngster, I went to Girl Guide Camp in Ontario, Canada, and we slept on the grass under canvas tents. And the only wooden buildings on site were those small little buildings that you go to when nature calls, the latrines. I thought that I was roughing it as a child, but when I listened to my dad's stories of camping canoe trips, I hear that he didn't use any tents at all. No man-made facilities, just the brush. Can you imagine having a grand home with every comfort and giving it all up to rough it in the great outdoors? Who would do that and why? Well, God did it to save us. Through Jesus, God came camping to be with us and to transform us. Let's return to the scripture that Frank read this morning. In the beginning was the Word. If you look at your scripture, you see that it's capital W Word. And when it's printed like that, it means Jesus. The Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt, skenono in Greek, means to pitch a tent. This image of pitching a tent draws its significance from the Old Testament, in which people looked for God in the tabernacle. After the Israelites were freed from slavery in Egypt and followed Moses into the desert, God asked them to build a tabernacle or tent to house the Ark of the Covenant, a sign of his presence. God asked for this sanctuary so that he might dwell among the people. 
The Israelites felt the presence of God in the tabernacle from the time of Moses until Solomon built the first temple. And then the ark and the presence of God was seen and felt to reside there. As the Jewish exile to Babylon began, Ezekiel provided a dramatic vision of the divine glory leaving the temple forever. And from that time forward, even though a second temple was built, the fullness of God's presence, God's Shekinah, God's glory, wasn't seen or felt again until it was seen and felt in the person of Jesus. God left the comforts of heaven and put on fragile human skin and came camping here with us in the person of Jesus. God once again pitched a tent and dwelt among us so that we could, as the scriptures say, see his glory, the glory of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Through Moses, God gave us the law. And the law is like guardrails that sort of show us the way and keep us hemmed in on the highways of life. But the problem is we humans aren't that clever and we keep crashing into them. The laws are good, but humans constantly fail at keeping those high standards of righteousness. So God came camping with a backpack full of grace and truth. God's grace is undeserved love. Every other religion on earth is about people seeking God, people trying to figure out how to be good enough to get to God's love. Christianity is about God seeking people. John 3. God so loved the world, he sent his only son, Jesus, so that whoever believes and trusts in him shall have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn his people. He sent him to save them. God loves us. God wants to be with us now so that we can feel and see and experience the fullness of that love and life. And respond to it and God wants to be wants us to be saved to have that love and life eternally that's grace Jesus also came with truth nobody's ever seen God directly but through Jesus we truly see what God is like he lived out God's laws and showed us what they looked like he showed us how to love God and how to extend that love to others. He was the fulfillment of law. He was the reality that the law points to. Max Lucado, Lucado describes the incarnation this way. Jesus was touchable. He was approachable. He was reachable. He was authentic and ordinary. The eternal word became a man. Became the sort of man that drops from exhaustion after a long day. A man who weeps with friends at a funeral. A man who attends banquets with people, all sorts of people, who could ruin one's reputation. A man who becomes frustrated with his friends when they don't listen. A man who suffers under the weight of evil. A man who pleads with heaven over the direction of his life. When God in Christ, came from heaven to earth. He came all the way. He was down to earth. Jesus came camping with the mosquitoes and the spiders, with the heat and the dirt, with our human misunderstandings and false priorities and fears and self-centeredness and self-protecting tactics. God in Christ did the un- Thinkable, the unimaginable, the inconceivable, our holy and righteous and highly exalted God came and pitched a tent in the darkest, dirtiest corners of the world. 
God, in Jesus, came camping with us so that we could become like him. He came to set us free, to forgive our sins, to bring life to our deadliness, to bring light to our darkness, to fill us up with holiness, to transform us with love, to teach us how to live, to empower us to be overcome our misunderstandings and our fears and our self-centeredness and to work towards mercy and justice. As Jesus' time on earth drew towards the end, he told us about our next dwelling. He said, don't be afraid. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places and I'm going ahead to prepare one for you. If we believe in Jesus, our eternal home is assured. At that same dinner, in that same conversation, he left us with two more promises. First, those who believe in Jesus will also do the works that he did. In fact, together we will be able to do even greater work. And second, we will never be without God's presence again. Jesus promised us that the Holy Spirit would show us the way and remind us of all that Jesus taught. Jesus said the spirit of truth will abide in us. God lives in you. Your heart beats with God's love. Nothing can separate you from God's love and power. And God is still with us. All that has changed is the location of the tent. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we become the tent in whom God's Spirit dwells. We, the church, are the tent where the world meets Christ. We, the body of Christ, by His power and His grace, are the hands and reaching out to heal a broken world and the feet going places where the help is needed. And we are his ears listening to people in a way that honors their God-given worth. We are his voice sharing the satisfying good news of God's grace and love in a desperately dirty and broken world. Amazingly, we are the tent in which God dwells in the wilderness of this world. I went with my grandchildren to camp this week to be with them, to have fun and play with them. I love them. I love being with them. But I want more for them than to just feel my love. I want them to feel God's love as well. And I want to see God's love and life revealed in them. One of the most striking names that scripture gives us for Jesus is Emmanuel. It's a Hebrew word which means God with us. The implications of the name are both comforting and unsettling. The thought that the word of God pitched a tent and dwelt as an ordinary man among us is comforting. God understands exactly what we're going through. Jesus brought all the grace and truth we need for us to be part of God's life and love throughout eternity. But the implications of Christ with us are also unsettling because with God's spirit in us, we have the responsibility to reveal that love to others. The world became flesh and pitched a tent among us. Emmanuel, God with us. Emmanuel, God revealed in us. Amen.